Well, welcome everyone. Um, we'll just give it a few more minutes to let people join and get their Zoom settled in. All right, Ariana, it is two after. We can go ahead and get started if you'd like. Awesome, thanks so much. All right, well, welcome everybody to our February Funky Bug session. Um, today we're doing uh, Communion Congo Hemorrhagic Fever. So our presenters today are going to be Dr. Adam Beicher, um, Jenna Rocker from Lab, and then Adam Sorensen. Um, so just a brief introduction. Uh, Jenna Rocker has worked in the medical laboratory field for 12 years now. Uh, her first lab job was in as a diagnostic molecular, molecular virology laboratory, and she has kept her interest in infectious disease ever since. She's now the laboratory quality and regulatory compliance manager for Denver Health Labs and has been with Denver Health for eight years. And she has joined our team, oh, sorry about that, joined our team, um, the HIT team in 2021. Adam Sorensen is our nurse educator for the BCU. And then Dr. Beicher is a native of Colorado who came back from Denver Health in 2018 after spending 10 plus years on the East Coast. He attended George Washington University for medical school and did his training in internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Massachusetts. He works here in the hospital medicine department, pediatric emergency department, and pediatric wards, and is one of the Colorado medical directors for our BCU. Additionally, his roles at home include a uh, chief typical officer of his three boys, chef de cuisine, and chauffeur. So thank you all for presenting, and I'm excited to get started. I will hand it over to Dr. Beicher. Thanks, Ariana. Um, so to start, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, CCHF uh, and show sort of its distribution. I will try and go quickly through a lot of these um, slides, uh, but please, if there are any pressing questions about the pictures that come up, feel free to jump in uh, or raise your little hand on Zoom. Uh, but so as you can see here, there's uh, quite a wide distribution of uh, area that the disease can be found. Um, as you can see in the light, sort of light yellow shade there, showing where the hyaloma tick um, is found. It's sort of at the peak of this 50 degree north latitude is where we found these ticks, which carry the, the, uh, the virus. Um, and all the countries in yellow um, are where we have from a public health standpoint, found uh, virologic proof that uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever can exist. And then the orange and the red is primarily where uh, cases have really been seen. One thing to note with this and with uh, almost all of our infectious diseases is that with climate change, we uh, may be seeing a change and there is some uh, theories and some people are postulating now that this 50 degree north latitude geographic distribution may be uh, changing and we may start seeing CCHF uh, spreading uh, into different European countries as uh, the climate is becoming more favorable for ticks to live in more northern climates as well. All right, next slide. Um, so again, as you can see, these are, you know, areas where the countries are at risk. 
that we consider uh, all outlined um, by their borders. And then the dots are where we have isolated CCHF. Um, and of all the tick-borne illnesses, which we'll talk about some different tick-borne illnesses later on, um, CCHF is the most widely dispersed sort of geographically, as you can tell, it covers, um, you know, most of Africa, as well as uh, including sort of all of Eastern Europe and sort of Southwestern Asia. Next slide. Um, the in different reviews um, of the true um, like history of CCHF and where we have seen it. Um, originally, the disease was described through uh, different Arabic texts um, in what is currently in Tajikistan. Uh, in the 12th century, there was some writing uh, describing this hemorrhagic disease, which we believe is uh, probably the same uh, disease that we see now. The first sort of modern uh, description of it in modern medicine uh, was during World War II. Uh, the, there was a group of about 200 Soviet personnel in the Crimean Peninsula that ended up having this disease. Um, and then in the late 50s in what was then Congo, what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, also, this disease was described in, a, um, in the mid-60s. It was actually microbiologically identified to be the exact same virus. Um, and so that's when we have since combined this and called it Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Um, uh, as you can tell, the table on the left here are the number of outbreaks that we have recorded um, and like I said, it includes Southeast Europe, uh, Asia, areas of the Middle East, and uh, Africa as well. And there are various uh, sort of peaks, um, primarily though, uh, you know, throughout the 80s, 90s, and, and early 2000s. We haven't had significant outbreaks uh, as of late, which is uh, sort of delightful. Um, the uh, smaller table on the, the bottom right here uh, shows the number of cases and years of different outbreaks that occurred um, through nosocomial infections sort of during a hospital stay or with exposure in the healthcare setting. So, you know, we can, and Adam Sorensen will talk about this later, but there are, you know, sort of two different ways and means that we uh, have infection that we need to sort of consider and think about part of the reason we're talking about this uh, in regard to our, our hit team in the biocontainment unit is we have to have a high degree of suspicion about these infections as they can cause problems. Next slide. Now, if anyone really wants to geek out about this later, we can talk all about the like proteins and the viral coat structures and all of these things. But very briefly, uh, it's the Bunia viride family. Uh, that's where the CCHF virus falls under. Um, the genus is Nirovirus, if anyone gets excited about that. Um, but uh, essentially, it's a single-stranded enveloped RNA virus. Um, it is a tick-borne virus. So again, it um, lives within a tick and then the tick will uh, distribute this virus uh, via, via blood and via infection through uh, attaching to a host. And so, um, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's uh, dependent on the vector and, and then it's very uh, geographically distributed throughout the world. Next slide. Um, Again, so it's, there's this enzootic cycle and then the, the epidemic or the epizootic um, methods of transmission. Um, so this exoded tick um, is the 
as I mentioned, the reservoir and the vector for the virus. Um, so the tick gets infected. Um, and again, not all ticks are infected with this, but they can become infected. And then the ticks feed on all of the different uh, uh, sort of like livestock um, or different uh, animals found in nature. And then our exposure to these animals uh, is how we end up with the tick uh, getting on us, very similarly to Lyme disease, which is a pretty common uh, issue here in the United States for people, something that they're familiar with, I think, but uh, it's a very similar uh, like pathology. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is uh, some pictures of this exoded tick. Uh, it's uh, very, very teeny tiny in its smallest form. Uh, if any of you have had the opportunity to live in New England or the East Coast, uh, I'm sure everyone has had the chance to uh, search a child or a partner or someone for a tick uh, and, you know, commonly looking behind ears and trying to find all sorts of fun ways to remove ticks from people. Um, they typically will burrow the head uh, into the, into the skin there and you'll often just be able to see the, the sort of body of the tick sticking out and, uh, not always the easiest things to remove, usually uh, requiring some tweezers. Uh, anyways, small little guys. All right, next next slide. Um, so the sort of from a patient standpoint, from a medical standpoint, when we get to this, uh, there's this incubation period, which makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, for, you know, the tracing and for um, getting to control all of the diseases, but luckily it's not uh, too long of a time period. So we, we are able to sort of contain uh, the disease once we're suspicious of it. The incubation, as you can see, is, you know, anywhere from three to seven days, um, it's usually on the longer end with a tick exposure. And if there's bloodborne exposure or some other nosocomial uh, concern, then it's usually on that shorter side. Uh, in this uh, incubation period, once someone becomes sick, there's a pre-hemorrhagic phase, which unfortunately has very, very common symptoms that I think everyone has experienced fevers, headaches, myalgias, dizziness, GI symptoms, any of these um, can really be present with almost any viral infection, uh, which is part of the challenge. And so that, you know, can last anywhere for, you know, one to seven days, um, but, you know, usually in the range of three, four days. And then the only thing that's a little bit different is this upper body hyperemia. So you'll get this flushing or this redness um, that can be seen in the upper body of patients. After this time period, um, once a patient will flip into this hemorrhagic phase, it only lasts a few days, two to three days. And that's really where the body uh, sort of does a great job of being able to create antibodies and fight back against the disease or uh, the disease uh, ends up sort of killing a, a patient. Um, the mortality is very wide um, between five and 50%. So again, it, it really depends. There's a lot of different co uh, comorbidities that I'll describe here in a second that can help push whether that mortality is gonna be on the lower side or the higher side. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so as you can see here with this evolution of symptoms, sort of thinking back again to this timeline, you have this incubation period, um, after, after infection, and then this pre-hemorrhagic phase with this sort of onset of symptoms and this very large, um, sort of fever curve and viral replication. And then as viral replication sort of comes down, 
uh, like I said, you have this immunologic response and this IgM response um, that can happen within about a week. And this is sort of where we start to see the body either um, picking up and starting to improve um, or, you know, after a few days, um, sometimes you'll start to see during this hemorrhagic period uh, where, where patients tend to do worse. Uh, next slide. So again, do, in a study that the Lancet did uh, analyzing some just blood markers for determining and seeing if there was anything that could help us predict how patients would do, um, you know, again, you could sort of, what they did is they were able to use PCR in the first nine days and actually like find, uh, find disease. Um, and then in this seven day to four month period, we saw these spikes in uh, IgM after the host response. Um, and as you can see here, the dotted line where you have platelets trending down, 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 down. And then once you get into this hemorrhagic phase is when we really see patients who do poorly, they go into DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. So the, the body really just, um, is, uh, the, the clotting cascade is, um, just really uh, like flipped on its head. And so the, the body is also breaking and making clots indiscriminately. Uh, you have a drop in your platelet activity and then your, your liver function tests also show uh, significant changes in the liver inflammation. Um, and so that's a lot of times where people will then have uh, death. DIC is a uh, pretty challenging uh, constellation of symptoms to try and manage. Uh, and then as you'll see patients that convalesce and do better, actually their platelets uh, tend to tick up pretty rapidly. Uh, next slide, there. But as you can see in this slide, sort of as I described the, you know, as we're getting out to the eight, nine days and we're seeing these mild cases, um, you see this uptick in, in platelet count. Um, and so, uh, we really, you know, we, we talk about thrombocytopenia, um, all of these patients are sort of experiencing, a, uh, what we would consider a thrombocytopenia for the, you know, almost for this initial, uh, pre-hemorrhagic and then almost into the hemorrhagic phase, those that tend to do better, um, have, have a, rapid rise and even the patients that survive these severe cases, their platelets, you know, trend back up into the normal, uh, normal range. Also in patients that had a fatal disease, you know, platelet counts remained under 50,000. Next slide. Around. Uh, as I said, these are some of the comorbid factors and some of the things, um, it's called this severity grade score that we use. Um, or you can use when, uh, when taking care of a patient. Um, and all of these things here on the left, prognostic factors associated with sort of more severe disease. Um, and uh, the table here on the right gives us this, uh, this way of scoring the, the SGS here. Um, so both LFT levels uh, an LDH, which is another uh, lab test that we use in determining uh, a patient's, uh, whether or not a patient is like breaking down red blood cells. Um, and then white count. Uh, and then as you can see here, even just being above 60, if there's any evidence of bleeding. Uh, and then the platelets, like I mentioned, you can get two points for that the prolongation of PT, another way that you can get two points. Um, and that's another just uh, measure of their, uh, their clotting time. Next slide. Um, one of the things we, when we're, you know, encountered with a, a patient like this and we're sort of going through any of these 
uh, very broad differentials. Hopefully we've been able to get uh, a decent history about what's going on with the patient, have a thought that maybe there's a, uh, a tick exposure. And so then we can really uh, narrow it down, hopefully based on just where, where they are in the world. And then also these, uh, these other exposures, but as you can see, a lot of different infectious complications, uh, primarily from, uh, vector borne illnesses, uh, and most of these Q fever, rickettsia, shigella, or I'm sorry, Q fever, rickettsia, ehrlichia, uh, Lyme disease, the aptly named tick-borne encephalitis, um, the Kiasanur uh, fever, and then uh, Omsk and uh, Alkumra are all tick-borne vectors. Um, malaria, as we know, is a mosquito-borne illness. Um, and then uh, Again, some of these other viral hemorrhagic fevers uh, can, can also be on our differential for depending on where the patient was. Uh, next slide. Uh, so again, like I said, you know, diagnosis is, is pretty challenging. Um, and one of the most important things is, again, getting that real good history, knowing where a patient has been, if they have had exposure to uh, wild animals or potentially have any tick exposures themselves. Um, and uh, being able to use this SGS uh, should hopefully raise our suspicion or at least make us uh, a little bit more concerned too when thinking about um, uh, CCHF. The uh, methods that we have right now are, you know, a real-time PCR, like I mentioned, and that is really only available for us in, in, you know, about day three or four after someone would present, but you need to be in a hospital. I don't know how available, and hopefully Jenna can talk to us all about that, um, about how we do PCR and sort of what settings we need to do that. Um, ELISAs or enzyme-linked immunoassays, um, looking at IgM and IgG, but we're already in that sort of uh, window of four to seven days where we're talking about your immune system already responding. So we need to have some immune response to the body and hopefully we're not too late at that point in time uh, in treating a patient. Uh, and lastly, I think for diagnostic uh, purposes, like we don't have a rapid test available. And um, unfortunately, uh, I don't know from, from my, my research and looking at these things, I don't know of any companies who are uh, really chopping at the bit to spend lots of money to develop a rapid test uh, for CCHF because uh, I don't think there's a, a significant demand for it at the moment. Next slide. Um, so real big, uh, prevention and, and sort of, uh, treatment options if we get there. So the, the prevention and the number one thing, and, uh, Adam will, uh, give us all his expertise on this, but it's primarily, uh, avoiding exposure to ticks, um, and using tick treatment if we're out in the wild and then. Uh, if we do have patients that we're concerned about, it's really going to be PPE and, and really being vigilant and thoughtful about uh, how we can use our PPE. Uh, there are no vaccines approved currently. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a vaccine that was attempted to be created in, of an inactivated virus in, in the 70s in Bulgaria. Uh, and then in 2015, uh, there was some uh, inactivated preparation of the virus from a cell culture, but there have been no uh, good studies that have shown efficacy at the moment. Um, our, there are some poten potential DNA vaccines and viral vector candidates, which we use for other uh, immunizations. Uh, and then 
the, uh, the CCHF virus like replicon particle. Um, these are some, some different uh, sort of candidate, vaccine candidates that are, are trying to be created to, that uh, have similar uh, protein uh, sort of like expressions to our immune system. Once patients are infected, uh, really what we have right now are uh, just sort of broad antivirals like ribavirin. Um, and then there's some idea and some thought about using monoclonal antibodies, but none of these have been uh, proven to be highly effective. Um, methylprednisone has also been tried as a treatment as well, but uh, next slide. Um, one possible thing that uh, I saw recently that's, that started is a, uh, there's a group called Prometheus, um, which is a, uh, a large research consortium. Um, and it's, uh, it's pretty interesting, this group of individuals. Um, and as you can see here, it's this group, like a lot of different uh, a lot of different biotech groups, someone from this uh, person from the Albert Einstein School of Medicine, uh, this other gentleman from uh, UT Austin and his other academic, some other academic labs, biotech companies and, and USAMRID are using essentially COVID um, technology and using things that, using this technology of mapping out the uh, the protein, the infective protein piece of uh, the virus. And then these are bound to antibodies that uh, were found in a, a patient who had uh, convalesced. And so they're trying to essentially 3D print these or 3D map these and then create new uh, vaccines and, and antibodies. Um, they, they did a few... Uh, of these studies on mice and they found that uh, of this bispecific antibody. So the green and white and the blue and white sections are the antibody. Um, those, uh, those, this bispecific antibody that was injected into mice um, actually helped these mice be cured and then uh, injected into sort of naive mice that helped them prevent infection um, when they were exposed to CCHF. Um, so potentially uh, options moving forward. Next slide. Uh, as I mentioned already, um, you know, trying to use uh, ribavirin and uh, fav favipiravir, I can never say that one right, um, using these two different uh, antivirals as as ways to try and limit virus replication um, and then monoclonal antibodies and, and steroids as our, as our go-tos at the moment, uh, along with just lots of supportive therapy in, in terms of helping patients convalesce. So, but hopefully uh, maybe with some, some newer technology and, and science moving forward, we'll get some other treatment options. All right, next slide. So big take home points is uh, tick-borne disease. It's very widely distributed throughout Africa, Southeast uh, Europe and uh, the Middle East, Southwest Asia. Um, and you have this incubation phase, pre-hemorrhagic hemorrhagic phase, and then hopefully a convalescence. Um, and currently we don't have any sort of uh, licensed vaccine, but um, once patients are exposed and, and uh, have an infection, if they can get through the infection, they um, often are healthy afterwards and, and we haven't had any relapses afterwards. So that's all I get. All right, thanks Dr. Beicher. Um, move on to Jenna Rocker from lab. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so 
Yep, there's my first slide. Okay. Um, so today I'll talk about specimen collection, um, te different testing methods that are available for the CCHF virus, um, what testing we have available at our Denver Health Lab, um, how results are confirmed, and then how we ship um, CCHF virus specimens. Slide. Um, so for specimen collection, generally we're going to want an EDTA blood specimen. That's the preferred specimen type. That's the lavender top tube, um, and that can be just collected through normal phlebotomy procedures. Um, and PPE is needed for performing phlebotomy for a patient suspected with CCHF. It's basically just going to be standard precaution PPE, which is lab coat, um, gloves, a mask, and eye protection. Um, and then all of your supplies need to be disposed of in proper containers for biohazard waste and sharps waste. Next slide. Um, so there's a few different testing methods available um, to detect the CCHF virus. Um, ELISA is one of those. It can be used for antigen or antibody capture. Um, again, we would be looking for the IgG and IgM targets if we're doing antibody ELISA. Um, virus isolation by cell culture is an available methodology. Um, this testing isn't um, not really the preferred method. Um, it requires manual manipulation of the specimen, so that kind of gives a higher risk of um, exposure for the lab personnel. It also takes about like three to five days to grow the virus in culture, so it um, takes quite a while. Um, however, we do have uh, real-time PCR um, testing available, um, which is pretty fast compared to culture and ELISA. Um, and uh, that's what the CDC currently uses as a real-time PCR. Um, and then in our high-risk pathogen lab here at Denver Health, um, we are working on implementing the Global Fever Panel. Um, this is created by a company called BioFire. We um, perform the test on the film array analyzer. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that panel test a little bit later on. Next slide. Um, so like I mentioned, at the CDC, they're doing the real-time PCR testing. They use an EDTA whole blood specimen for that. They also have the serology testing available. They use the ELISA methodologies for antibody or antigen detection. Um, as I think it's more of a like double confirmation test after the PCR. Um, and so in order to submit a specimen to the CDC's viral special pathogens branch, um, there's a consultation process that has to happen. And we'd have to go through um, our state health lab at CDPHE to get that consultation started. Um, and so once approval is received, um, we submit a specimen submission form, and then from there we would ship the specimen. Um, CDC gives us instructions for um, the temperature conditions that the specimen needs to be stored or shipped under, um, and then they guarantee results within four days. <laughs> so in our high-risk pathogen lab here at Denver Health, um, we will start offering the Global Fever Special Pathogens Panel. Um, that should go live like by the end of next week, I believe. Um, so it's a qualitative multiplexed nucleic acid-based test, and I mentioned before it's on our BioFire film array instrument, which we already have equipped in that laboratory space. Um, so the panel identifies six pathogens and then gives a presumptive identification for eight other pathogens, including um, the CCHF virus. Um, so if we detected a presumptive positive CCHF virus here at our laboratory, we would then work with CDPHG um, to get that testing sent to the CDC for confirmation. Next slide. Um, and then as far as shipping specimens, um, to the CDC, we would use Category A shipping. Um, so that includes triple packaging. We need a leak-proof secondary container and a rigid outer packaging. Um, and all of our lab hit team members um, have training and certification to perform Category A shipping um, for those types of specimens. So 
that's all I have. All right, thank you, Jenna, um, for presenting that. We'll move on to Adam Sorensen. Yeah, thank you, Ariana. I'm going to go over a couple of things here for person person transmission or tick borne illnesses. Dr. Beicher mentioned. Um, so, the big thing is on Netex website, they have a great presentation on kind of what all things you should um, look for to admit to a place like a biocontainment unit. So, taking the fatality rate, mode of transmission, lack of treatment, and the rarity of CCHF mission to a biocontainment unit can be considered. And I'd say it can be because um, in a couple slides down, you'll see that one out of five patients or one out of five people develop uh, hemorrhagic fever. Um, four out of the five are positive, but do not go into the um, viral hemorrhagic state. So person person transmission through blood and body fluids. So as mentioned, it would be uh, laboratory, phlebotomy, anybody in direct contact with the patient, um, providing healthcare to them. And then for our ask or identify ISO and form is this is a tricky thing because they initially present like pretty much any other um, virus as Dr. Beischer mentioned. So it's Reasonable to, for somebody to suspect Lyme disease, um, given in Northern Hemisphere or in the United States, but it, some more investigation on uh, recent travel history, things of that nature. Um, and then for AGPs, and then as mentioned before, the fatality rate is all over the place. Um, one could suspect that it's maybe a little bit lower if, basically if we're, if one out of five people are presenting with uh, CCHF, you got to think that there's more people walking around infected, but not displaying signs and symptoms. Next slide, please. So question for anybody, if you want to come off mute, um, what would you do? One in five are symptomatic. What if an individual tests positive is asymptomatic? And then what precautions would you take for an asymptomatic individual? Anybody? God, I I truly don't have the answer. <laughs> I, Adam, I, I don't think I would do anything. Yeah, so this is a shameless plug for our VAM, um, our virtual assessment model at Denver Health to where maybe at home testing um, and the patient could quarantine at home. Uh, of course, that would be take involvement with our state, local state um, health departments, as well as CDC. But I I don't know. I don't know the answer to this because um, they're asymptomatic. So they're walking around fine, but they would test positive um, for the virus. But they're not going to go into all the things that um, has been previously presented from a viral hemorrhagic state. So PPE, um, would it be universal precautions? Would you need to go all the way to the type of PPE that is used in a biocontainment unit? I, I truly don't know. I would say this, though. If you have an individual in the hospital, um, maybe for other reasons, or is presenting hospital just uh, generalized not feeling well, it's always a good thing to start high on your PPE and then back off as time goes on um, just to prevent any potential infection to others. Next slide, please. So for the patient that is in full-blown Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever and displaying all the signs and symptoms, uh, at Denver Health, we would do our full PPE garb, um, which is level four PPE, same as what you see people wearing for, say, Ebola virus. Um, put BSL level four labs, that's more of a guidance of helping dictate what type of PPE you're also going to use there. And then, of course, negative pressure room for these patients, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic is always a good thing because you never know when an aerosol, AGP or aerosolizing generating procedure is going to happen. 
So you'd rather be protected than um, have the oopsie factor. Next slide, please. Um, this is shown previously, but it's to reinforce the identify, isolate, and form. Um, we can look at it a couple of different ways. Individuals who work with livestock or animals, so zoos, um, hunters um, could be exposed to the tick itself. And then, of course, healthcare personnel um, with uh, bodily fluids from an infected individual. Next slide, please. So the regions that was shown um, as theorizes Dr. Beicher mentioned to be expanding based off of global warming. The one thing I wanted to maybe foot stomp is a lot of those regions also have um, current conflicts happening within them um, and something to think about with repatriation of um, service members or people who have been in those areas, they are not living in nice, warm, cozy quarters. A lot of them are out in the field or down ranges, they say, um, who are exposed to things like ticks. Um, and they don't have things like DEET to help prevent um, ticks from latching onto them and then passing the virus to them. So one of the things from the identify, isolate, and form is um, when you're getting that travel history or exposure risk is individuals like that. Um, and of course, healthcare workers um, are at risk for being exposed. And then one thing we know, it's more common in the spring and summertime, uh, CCHF. And then, of course, I, this is the one thing that does make it easier than, say, a vector born from mosquito is most of us know when a tick has latched on and bit us um, because it's not easy to get them off of us. So um, you're actively working to get them out or get them to on burrow. So you know that at least you've a tick is the vector. Next slide, please. So after a tick bite is three to seven days with blood, five to six days. And the reason why I'm re, um, covering this is it's just more anticipatory of the patient's trajectory while admitted in the hospital. Um, it, it will help you to figure out maybe some proactive things that you may have to be doing earlier on if it's bloodborne compared to tick borne. But the overall treatment is going to be supportive care. The couple things that you could think of, especially with DIC, is that can be very difficult um, to see somebody through. And it can be a lot of work and challenging. So some things you could think about is a heparin drip for DIC. Um, and then I would be curious to know if this would take research. But how, do, how about repleting platelets? or providing platelets to the patient, um, even if it's not fully indicated to help get their platelet levels up. Um, we saw the curve earlier to maybe, would that help with uh, decrease in uh, mortality rate or improving survival? So generally recovery starts ninth or 10th day, um, which is significantly shorter than our viral hemorrhagic fevers like uh, Ebola. Um, which can be persistent for up to a month. Next slide, please. And just recapping, these are some of the things that you could do um, in a biocontainment unit uh, during the phase one. Um, always trying to change that fever curve. So you could always consider things like Tylenol, um, ibuprofen, if indicated, uh, but more so you're going to take your cooling measures, room temperature down in the room, cooling blankets. Um, if you're having a hard time with that fever curve, you could use a catheter that goes in the groin that is a closed circuit to cool the patient internally. The upside of that is you have, it's like a triple lumen central catheter, um, which if they progress into that uh, DIC and uh, hemorrhagic phase, you will need significant amount of IV access, especially if you're thinking about doing all these different drips, electrolytes, um, fluids, blood products, uh, medications, as mentioned before, heparin potentially, 
and then um, your IV antibiotics potentially for any type of secondary infections related to, say, um, indwelling urethral catheters and all that other stuff. So IV, well-established IVs. Um, one thing to consider is a longer IV or angiocath because with the swelling and everything else, um, you want to make sure that's seated into the vein and doesn't work its way out. So having one of the longer extended angiocaths could prolong the use and um, viability of that IV. And next slide, please. So a couple things here that the patient's going to present with is sleepiness, depression, abdominal pain, and uh, hepatomegaly. Um, Dr. Beischer could speak to this. Uh, when I worked in pediatrics, it was actually easy to palpate a large um, liver and or spleen um, in adults, not so much, but that's something that part of your assessment that could help uh, just kind of see how they're doing and potentially if you don't have the diagnosis um, continuing to work towards something like crummy uh, Congo hemorrhagic fever. Next slide, please. And then hemorrhagic phase, the not so fun phase. Um, and then pre proactively, are you going to line them up with all the things, potentially CRT, uh, all the drains, um, accurate eyes and O's for uvolemic status. Um, and then blood products are, of course, going to be something. And what you have to think about here is we're sending off labs. Um, to the CDC for confirmation and also repeat lab send offs to CDC for viral clearance. So you're going to be drawing a lot of labs um, at frequent intervals, um, not necessarily just for, send, for sending off the labs to CDC or to the high risk pathogen lab at Denver Health, but also. You're going to be checking uh, basic metabolic panels, your uh, CBC, electrolytes, um, LFTs, all those things, your hepatic uh, enzymes. Next slide, please. So going back into more of the hemorrhagic phase and talked about here, um, I do want to preface with the tag uh, that is a wish list or in a perfect world we would be able to run those. Um, that is what the surgical ICU uses for guided resuscitation. But again, a CBC will be more than adequate to um, continue to trend the patient and see if there's any blood products needed. Um, and then from there, we have all the lines and drains. Big thing is the epistasics. Um, one thing to be aware of with these patients is you might need to pack their nose. Um, with the epistasics, I uh, did read in some articles that they can have significant amount of bleeding or a nosebleed to where you essentially are having to put um, something in their nose and keep it in there uh, to provide a tamponade for that uh, nosebleed. And next slide, please. All right, and a couple other things we haven't talked about, um, but some things to potentially consider is, and these are not tested, so it would be a conversation um, on risk benefit, but TXA, vitamin K, and albumin. Um, of course, electrolyte replacement and fluid replacement are the mainstays and the um, treatment for pretty much all viral hemorrhagic fevers. Next slide, please. So the convalescent phase is day 10 or it could go day 20. Um, these patients are going, you've seen them through the viral hemorrhagic phase and now they're on the getting better phase, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, you could have somebody who, since you've seen them through that phase is now delirious, um, things of that nature. So working on getting them on that wake sleep cycle uh, getting them through the delirium state and ideally best you can to prevent um, any of that from occurring. But in these situations, it's very difficult to do that. 
And then they may need continued uh, through IV or PO for Next slide, please. All right, so long-term effects of CCHF infection have not been studied well, as mentioned before, um, but recovery can be slow, and that's where it can work on getting physical therapy, speech therapy, and occupational therapy involved. Um, and how that would look would depend on kind of how things are being dictated from their viral load and things of that nature. Um, but getting them to up in chair, moving around, things like that. And then the complications for liver, renal, and pulmonary um, due to the course of illness is uh, things that you're going to have to be watching out for and could take a prolonged rehab. And then it's always a good idea to get psychology um, or a psych consult for these patients. Um, it can be a pretty traumatic experience for patients admitted to a biocontainment unit. Um, can lose their sense of humanity, um, given the amount of people who are in there in all of their full PPE um, and the loss of human contact and the feeling of removal from um, the world. Next slide, please. All right. And if anybody has any questions. Any questions from the group at all? If not, I actually have one um, for uh, Adam or uh, Dr. Breicher. When or what would the methylprednisone do? Like, how would that um, help with like the, the treatment? Uh, steroids are magic. Um, no, I I mean a lot of times um, we we'll use steroids in uh, any sort of a picture where a patient is like in shock. Um, often it's you know sort of just trying to help with the body's sort of underlying physiology from, from like undergoing shock, there's like thought that you'll end up having a cortisol deficiency. And so a lot of times in ICUs when patients will uh, have need like stress dose steroids essentially to keep everything functioning. Um, I, you know, I don't know that there's great evidence for it in this, I know in, in Adam, um, like in the ICU and in the trauma and critical care land, I think you guys probably use steroids more than I use it in the main part of the hospital anyways. Um, but I think they get used very frequently in, in settings where, where patients are like at risk of shock. Yeah, I would, I would say in the surgical ICU, steroids are actually used very infrequently. For people who are presenting with ARDS, uh, definitely steroids are indicated, um, and we do use a stress dose um, and go from there. But it's a risk-benefit because it also makes them um, susceptible for other infections. Um, and with these individuals, if, if they are the if they're full blown hemorrhagic um, side of it, you know, it's a risk benefit. It, it, we, potentially we have central line, we have uh, indwelling urethral catheter, are they intubated? And that makes it very risky. Um, but on the other end, it's for, it helps with their lungs uh, um, and other things. The one thing that, if doing that, everybody needs to be aware of too, is there were uh, blood glucose levels um, will significantly elevate with uh, steroids. So how would we manage that or would we not and let them let their blood glucose levels normalize that, 
dependent on is it a stress dose or are we going to maintain steroid therapy? It's helpful. Thank you. That clear as mud. Um, one of the other things actually too, and Adam, you were talking about using platelets. Um, and I think with this and with all other hemorrhagic fevers, something that could be really interesting, um, is like the idea of using a tag and, you know, I, th I think those would be interesting studies to see if like what part of the clotting cascade are patients actually deficient in, um, but, uh, you know, in, in some ways, I think we're fortunate enough that there's not a volume of patients that you could actually do a robust study in this. Um, but the idea of figuring out, oh, is it really their platelets or is it like a different factor that is being broken down or what, what is the issue in these hemorrhagic states? And like, could you replace that and could that help? with survival or, or long-term outcomes of this too. Awesome, thank you. Uh, any other questions from the group at all? Well, if any come up, um, definitely feel free to reach out. And thank you to our three presenters on a very informative presentation. I know I enjoyed it, so thank you. Um, and yeah, uh, anything else to add? Nope, I'll, I'll echo Ariana's comment. Thanks, Jenna, Adam, and Adam. Really appreciate your time on this. And we look forward to future Funky Bug topics. All right, thanks everyone.